for the rough start. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, this is Understanding Drupal. <coughs> My name is Mauricio Dinarte. You can find me as Dinarcon online pretty much anywhere. I am from Nicaragua, beautiful country, warm weather. So if you need a place to escape the cold Minnesota winter, beautiful place to go. Um, we have a lot of active volcanoes. If you want to see lava, if you're into that, you can do it uh, there in Nicaragua, or you can go to that website and go through a virtual tour, online tour of how that can be done. I work with a company called Agaric. We are distributed in different countries. And I'm also very passionate about training. So um, I will very soon start this project called Understand Drupal, where I will be teaching uh, these plus many other uh, courses in English, French, and German. So if you speak any of those languages, check that out in a couple of weeks. And this is an outline, an outline of what we're going to cover today. Um, so we use Drupal mostly to build websites, or at least that's what uh, we usually look uh, for Drupal for. Uh, but before going directly to the Drupal concepts, I want to take a step back and talk about websites in general. So if we have a website, let's say the New York Times, you have one domain, which is your whole website, but then you have individual pages for every single article or section on the website. So a website is composed of one or more different pages. And when you look at a single page, you will, you will identify a lot of uh, elements that are common. You don't have to be a Drupal developer at all to see that there is a logo somewhere in here. There might be some hero images, sidebars, footers, headers, and so on. So everybody here already uses the internet to some extent, and they have some knowledge already of, of how to interact with a website and what are the different elements of, of, the, of a website. So uh, my goal for the session is to translate all of these uh, Drupal concepts into what we already know, so that when we look at a Drupal page, we know how it was built. And by knowing how it was built, we can know how to modify it to, to, to our needs. Uh, why do we want to use Drupal? There are many reasons. For one, security. Until less than a year ago, the White House was built on top of Drupal. And around the globe, there are thousands of websites, government websites, that are built on Drupal. And as you can imagine, they require high level of uh, security standards. And Drupal can provide that. Also, Drupal can scale to serve very large uh, audiences. For example, Where.com receives more than 1 billion visits per month, and Drupal is serving that, not only through the website, but also uh, consuming, for example, from mobile applications. So you can have a very, very big site, and Drupal can scale to your specific needs. The Grammys.com uh, website is also built on Drupal, but the most important thing here is that on the night of the event, the whole thing is stream, uh, uh, streamlined on, over the internet. But and in addition to like the, the, the video that you see on TV, you can also have uh, interviews like in audio or video format or text format that are, are being consumed by thousands of people at the same time. So not only a lot of people, but also the diff different types of media can be exposed through Drupal. Web Economic Forum is also built on Drupal, and this is an example of a site that is uh, that has many languages available. So in Drupal 8 in particular, the multilingual capabilities are, are very good. Examiner.com is also on top, uh, built on Drupal. Naranja Tradicional de Gandia. You might probably never heard of this website. Uh, it is a company in, in Spain. They sell oranges, tangerines, sweets, marmalades, honey, and lemons. So it is true that Drupal can power very huge websites, but it can also power your own small business if you need to. And in this case, they are using Drupal to sell online. And Tesla Motors is also built on Drupal. Uh, rumors has it that Drupal uh, was used, you know, in the in the car launch recently, but we we don't have we we don't have confirmation yet about that. So. Just to recap, security, multilingual support, e-commerce uh, possibilities, uh, the possibility to uh, scale to very high traffic, multilingual, multilingual multimedia, and multi-device uh, capabilities make Drupal very interesting. If that convinces you, then what is Drupal? What is it about? Drupal is a content management system. 
And as such, it will allow multiple people to participate in the creation of content. There is no need to have one username and password that everybody shares. Instead, every if we were uh, to work in the same organization, each of us can have a username and a password in the same way that we have a username and a password for Facebook and Twitter, and then our interactions are going to be recorded on our behalf. When you have that, you can have pu pu publication workflows. A publication workflow, for example, will allow, uh, let's imagine that it, this is a newspaper. We have the journalist who writes the article, but before going to the newspaper side, it, it needs to go through an approval process. So the journalist has permissions to create articles, but not publish them out of the box. Then comes an editor that the editor cannot create articles, but only review and modify what a journalist uh, wrote. But let's say that uh, in this newspaper, you need uh, final approval from your department chief. So that person is not allowed to create or modify. The only thing that that person does is say, yes, this is going live or not. So with Drupal, you can have as, as simple or as complex workflows as you need. And you can many people can participate in that process. Uh, in Drupal, there is also a concept called content revisioning. And that basically means keeping track of any change that you make on the website. Let's say that. Uh, it, again, with the, newspa with the newspaper, you are writing an, a very long article and you don't have all the sources. So you might uh, want to uh, start writing it, saving as a draft, then continue writing it. But after it is published, uh, some new um, events came about and you want to update the article. Drupal will keep track of those changes by user, like who, who made the change, what made the change and what was exactly changed, like letters, images, and so on. This can uh, this comes uh, enabled out of the box. You don't have to do anything special. And for example, if for some reason someone got get into the, your site and do something improper, like put something some profanity information in the website, you can say, "Hey, this is bad. Uh, roll back to the previous version of this content, and you will get that automatically." And if that person is someone in your organization, you can track who did it and when, and then block that user to prevent them for to do this again. And another thing that Drupal allows you to do is give you very granular access control over every piece of information. For example, if you are selling online, you might have some VIP customers that you want to give a discount to. So you can present the, the website exactly the same to everyone except for the VIP customers. When they go to the product catalog, they're going to see the price with the discount. With the discount. So everything the same, images, descriptions, everything, except for the price. So you can choose to show either like a specific uh, pieces of information or whole sections blocked to the specific users or even the whole site. You can decide how much of your content is going to be available for everyone that interacts with your website. So today, uh, we're going to focus on the CMS part of Drupal, how to manage content. But also, Drupal is a framework. And as a framework, it allows you to extend it to uh, things that were not originally uh, their intent. For example, Drupal was never intended to be an e-commerce solution. But some people saw that Drupal already did a lot for them. So they just wrote a little bit of code to, make it integ to integrate Drupal with their e-commerce solutions. And you can also use uh, Drupal as a backend for your mobile application or your game, for example, uh, to store the content of, of, of your application or your game. And in my opinion, one of the biggest benefits of Drupal is its community. So there are hundreds of countries, uh, languages that Drupal supports, thousands of contributors and active users. So you're never alone. There will always be someone who can help. And the fact that I'm here from Nicaragua for this camp is, you know, it's a testament of how big of, of a community we are. And in the Twin Cities, you have a very vibrant community. So if you need help, I invite you to come to the meetups that happen at least once a month. So let's, uh, let's start diving into Drupal itself. Some basic concepts. Uh, in Drupal, you need to run a Drupal project, you need something that is called Drupal Core. If you don't have Drupal Core, it is not a Drupal project. And it comes with many things. Two of the most important things are modules and, and themes. A module adds functionality to your website, and a theme controls the appearance. 
For example, if you have your personal blog post and uh, your personal blog, and if you want that every time that you add a new article to your blog, that something is posted to Facebook automatically or a tweet is automatically sent, that is functionality. Anything that has to do with functionality in Drupal is provided by modules. On the other hand, if you want to change the color scheme or the fonts to be used or the layout uh, behavior when you are on a desktop device or on a mobile device, that is appearance. And the appearance is going to be controlled by the theme. And contrary to other platforms, for example, like, like WordPress, in Drupal there is a very clear distinction between the functionality part and the appearance part. So for the most part, uh, if you want to add functionality, be it uh, automatically Facebook posts or tweets or apply a discount uh, on certain conditions for some users, that is functionality that will be provided by a module. If you want to change the appearance of the website, that is going to be controlled by the theme. And one important thing about this is that because these are, th these are different concepts, you can change the theme to change the whole appearance of the website, but the content is going to remain the same. So you can do a full redesign without losing your content nor your functionality. You're only changing how the site is going to look. And with Drupal, we also have the contrib repository. So anything that is not Drupal core belongs to the contrib repository. And as I said before, Drupal is a framework that you can extend to do so many things, even things that do not exist today. So uh, as a community, we have created this contribution repository where we provide more modules and themes so that uh, people can uh, you know, add, add more things to, to their Drupal website. One important thing about the content repository and the image that we see here is that they are like Lego pieces. Usually a module is, uh, does one job very well and by combining different modules, you can get the functionality that you need. Like you have two or three modules to build uh, this e-commerce solution, for example. And in the country repository, we also find distributions. And distributions are special uh, packages of Drupal that in addition of, of Drupal core, they also come with extra modules and extra themes. And their purpose is to uh, to, to serve a very specific use case. For example, there are distributions for e-commerce websites. So they will come with a card checkout process already in place. There are distributions for newspapers, for governments. There are distributions for restaurants, for example, that come with menus already uh, built in. There are distributions for churches, for nonprofit organizations. So in addition of Drupal doing a lot for you, you can also use a distribution that will give you even more things out of the box and the distributions are found in the contrib repository. And one thing in terms of security, contrary to other projects, Drupal.org is the only place where you should go to download anything that is code, like a module, a theme, or a distribution. You should only go to Drupal.org because that is the only place where the security team uh, provides support. If you download something from, from another source, uh, that, that, that won't be covered by the security team. So you need to be careful. Uh, if, if we remember, uh, Drupal is a CMS, and the C stands for content, and this is the most important part uh, of Drupal. Uh, we need to remember that Drupal is a software that is over 15 years old, and we have some concepts that, uh, or, or, or rather some names that are not very intuitive. And one of those names is the word node. So, Node is the most important concept in Drupal and also one of those that are very confusing. A node is a piece of information that can tell a story by itself. And it is going to serve as a container to describe something. For example, in this image, I have a car. What can I say about the car? It is red, it has two doors, it, it, it is an electric car, and so on. I can start saying the year, the make, the model, the plate, and so on. So if you want to describe something in Drupal, you can do it using a node. What you describe can be a physical object like a car, or it can be something that is intangible like an event. So for example, uh, Twin Cities Drupal can happen from this day to that date. It has a registration price of X amount of dollars. Uh, it has so many sessions and so on. So you can describe something uh, either tangible or intangible, but as Anything can be stored in a node. 
This is an example of a node in Drupal. Uh, in this case, this is an article. Every node in Drupal will have a title that is for granted, and also they will have an author and a publication date. So Drupal will keep track of that automatically. In addition to that, uh, nodes have an internal identifier that is used by Drupal to tell one node from the other, like how do I differentiate this car from that car? How do I differentiate this event from that uh, event? And so on. That identifier is called node ID, and it is a number. The first node that you create is going to be node ID number one, and it will be increased by one every time that you create a new node. Um, you can delete nodes if you want, but deleting a node doesn't claim back that user that node ID. For example, if you create node one, two, three, <coughs> and then delete node number two, the next one that is going to be created is going to be node number four. Um, for the most part, you don't rely on, on node IDs, uh, but it is important to know that even if you delete one, it will not be reclaimed. Let's say that I, I wrote a very good article, and I tell you, uh, hey, go to my website by the node ID. So that would be, let's say, agari.com slash node slash 1535. Maybe by the time that you are at home, you have already forgotten the number. And it is common for us humans to remember phrases rather than numbers. So every node, in addition to having this internal identifier, they can also have something that is called URL alias. And that is what we see uh, at the top where it says agari.com slash blogs slash altering views results. So I can give you like a phrase, and that is going to be another way to access the same piece of information. So the node ID is required, a node will always have a node ID, but they can also optionally have a URL alias. And if they have a URL alias, you can use it to access the, the information. The node also has a publication status where it is public for everyone or only for site administrators. Um, they can also uh, have fields, which we're going to cover in a moment. So. We saw an example of describing a car and also describing uh, an event. But let's say that we're going to talk about vehicles in general. Can I have more wheels in addition to a car? Sure, you can have motorcycles, monocycles, three cycles, and you know, four wheels vehicles. In real life, there, uh, for example, between a motorcycle and a car, there are a lot of differences, like significant differences. As far as I know, a motorcycle cannot go in reverse and a motorcycle doesn't have windows. So when we are going, when we store information in Drupal, we need a, a way to differentiate between these different elements, like the motorcycle and the car. Uh, and we do that in Drupal using content types. So a content type is an abstraction that allows you to group nodes that share uh, similar characteristics or describe the same idea. The content type is going to be your template of, of where you collect your information. For example, for the car content type, you will collect year, plate, model, number of windows, number of doors, and so on. For the motorcycle, you will have a different template. And that template will not contain number of windows or number of doors because there are not any. In the event content type, you will have like the event dates, the registration price, the capacity of the event, and so on. So the content type is going to be the template that will allow you to collect the information. And once that information is collected, the content type will help you with uh, managing that information. One very important thing to note uh, is to understand the relationship between nodes and content types. Uh, every node is of one and only one specific content type. And one content type can have one or more nodes associated with it. So for example, I have the content type article and I have uh, node one, four, five, seven, and so on. The numbers in the bubbles, like in the, in the blue circles, represent the node ID. In basic page content type, I have node two, six, and 10. In the car content type, I have node three and nine. It is important to notice that the numbers do not repeat, again, because you cannot have the same node in two different content types. And this is just like a, a, an example image. Uh, but one thing to consider when working with content types, you can create as many as you want, but the more content types that you have, uh, you will add extra job 
to manage the website, uh, and it will become evident when we talk about permissions later. Uh, but if you have a content type with only one or two nodes, you might uh, try to to use a different approach. Like if you have, uh, let's say, three content types and each of those has no more than five co uh, nodes, you might try to combine them in a single content type and using fields, which is what we're going to cover next, uh, make differ differentiate between the different elements. Uh, as, again, Drupal will be very flexible and it will allow you to do whatever you want. Uh, but from a management point of view, it is better to have only the content types that you strictly require. So let's say that uh, we have this car dealership where we sell cars and motorcycles. But because I, I now have content types, now in my website I can say I only want to show cars. I don't want to show uh, motorcycles in this page, for example. So now a client comes to my website and they can see all the cars that I have in inventory. But when we're looking for something, we are looking for something specific. Maybe I, I might be looking for a Toyota, Yaris, Red, 2010, for example. So just having the content type to separate uh, you know, motorcycles from vehicles is not enough. I need to have other mechanisms to differentiate a specific vehicles, like a specific cars. And we do that using fields. So fields are very awesome. Does anyone here uses either Facebook or Twitter at least once in their lifetime? Some people, some people. So I'm going to explain fields uh, through examples of why they are useful. Um, let's say that you know this car dealership company, they have a website, but they also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And, for, and they are very successful, like every day they are getting more uh, cars in stock and they are selling a lot of cars. So for every car that comes to the, to the store, they will add it to the website, but also they will add it to Facebook as a post and to Twitter, like a, a tweet. What happens? When you have that, that much content, it gets really hard uh, to find old content. Maybe uh, I added a Toyota Yaris Red a month ago, and someone is coming today looking for something like that, but how do they look that in the timeline? In the timeline, that can get lost very quickly. And also, because this is a very big company, uh, there, are, there are many employees that are putting the information, and they might be putting the information inconsistently. So for someone trying to use the search capabilities of Facebook or Twitter, it might get really hard uh, for, for them uh, to be able to find anything. But the worst part of this is that both Facebook and Twitter allows you to put whatever you want. Uh, I guess that you might have seen people putting poems or rants or you know anything. And it, 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 this also applies for other example. Every employee can write whatever they want in whatever format they want, and that free text is not easily searchable. Uh, again, we can also have inconsistent data. Uh, if you're putting dates, you can say in November, like the full month spelled out, 19, 2015, or the, f the month abbreviated, or numbers instead of uh, letters, or the year two digits instead of four, for the separator dashes instead of slashes, or if you are a multilingual site, for example, in Nicaragua, we put the day before the month. So when you have this free, free text, then you can put anything, that anything might be inconsistent. And worse than that, it can also be invalid. So how old are you, minus 10 years old? When is your birthday, February 31st? Uh, what is the price? You, you have the US uh, dollar symbol, but with euros as, as the text currency. Your email is, is missing an ad sign. Your phone number, hi, I'm beautiful, happy face. That is not even a number. So there is no way you can enforce validation or consistency in a Facebook post or a tweet. And that's where fields are uh, very, very useful. So when you have all these things, Drupal cries. It's not very happy. But if you have fields, you can fix that. Because fields will allow you uh, to enforce validation criteria. For example, if you have a, a price field, you can say you cannot uh, save a new car if you do not define the price of the car. In addition to that, the minimum price cannot be lower than zero. Let's say that this is an old car that you will give away if someone buys an expensive one, but you will not pay 
people to to get stuff out, out of your out of your business. So the minimum price is going to be zero because we're selling in the U.S. We know for sure that we're working with dollars, so we can define prefixes and suffixes when we are entering card information to make it clear to the people entering the information, but also to make it clear to the people coming to the website looking for, for cars. So all of this uh, is provided by fields. And every, there are different types of fields. So each field will provide different validation criteria. So for example, we can have an image field where we say, I, will, I, I don't want it to make, uh, make it require, but I want to allow PNG, GIF, JPEG uh, files. I also want to enforce a minimum resolution of the image. I might also want to enforce a maximum resolution. I don't want the image file itself to be larger than five megabytes because like that's too much already, and so on. Uh, so for every type of fields, there are going to be uh, different validation criteria. So when you start doing this, Drupal gets happier and happier. And if you want to make Drupal love you, you have to follow a very simple recipe. For every piece of information that you want to store, you are going to create a new field. So going back to the card example, the make is going to be a, a field, the year is going to be a field, the color, the, uh, the model, type of field, number of windows, number of store, and so on. For every piece of information, you will have one Drupal field. And in addition to that, you, you need to select the proper field type because the proper field type is going to give you the proper validation criteria. So by doing that, Drupal will love you and will reward you with many things. For example, Drupal will allow you, by the use of these fields, to collect information in many different ways. Let's say that um, this event, Twin Cities Drupal Camp, is happening at the School of Law in the city of Minneapolis and so on. That is, we are storing a, a, an address, a point in, on, on Earth. So there are many different ways to do that. You can collect that information by an address, like text, or by latitude and longitude, or you can show the user a map and ask them to click, to put a pointer on the map, or in the same way that we have, for example, PDF files or Word documents, there are some specific file types to store geographical information. One of them is called KML. So an alternative would be to provide like an upload, a file upload field where they can upload KML files and Drupal will automatically read that information and store it for you. So uh, one Drupal field can allow one or multiple ways to collect the information. And also when the information is collected, Drupal will allow you to present the information in one or multiple ways. And in between, it stores the information in a consistent way so that the way that it entered is not doesn't have to be the way that it goes out. You can enter like uh, by address and you can present a map, for example, and that's totally valid. In real life, there is no one single Drupal module. Re remember, all of this uh, is functionality, like mapping some text or coordinates into a point in, in, in on Earth. This is functionality. Uh, showing the map is functionality. So there is no one Drupal module that will allow these four ways to enter addresses, but by combining different modules, you can accomplish this behavior if you need it. But the point that I'm trying to, to make is that it is possible and actually very common for one module to provide a field type that allows collecting and presenting information in many different ways. And once the information is collected, you can present it like individually or you can present it in an aggregated manner. For example, you can collect a lot of different uh, events, like th this page called drupical.com is a real website where you can see Drupal events happening all over the world. And again, this is a huge international community. You are never alone. And in this case, for example, uh, they are aggregating the information in one map. And if you pay close attention, they are using field information to, to color cop the pointers. So not, they are not only showing you know, the pointers on the map, they are also showing different colors depending on the type of event. And you can do that with fields, like combining fields information. Let's say I combine the information, I take the information from the address field to put the marker, and I take the information from the type of event field to put a color. And again, Drupal is super flexible in, in once you have the information in your system, you can present it in as many ways as you need. 
Um, also, when you have one field for each type of information, you can cherry pick what you want to show or what you want to hide. Uh, maybe, you know, for example, uh, Drupal, usually in Drupal events, uh, there is someone who counts how many people attend the event, and that is for internal use, not, not for everyone. So when we go as individuals, as regular users to the session description, we don't see how many people attended, but that information can be stored internally and just hidden from us, and only available for the camera organizer, for example. So when you, when you have, uh, you know, fields, you can decide what to show and what to hide for different type of, of users. And some example of field types, uh, we have regular single line text field, we have multi-line text field in Drupal, there is a difference between the two. What it says established in 2006, that is actually, even though there is text there, that is actually a number field. That is a number field because we are uh, storing information about organizations and what, what we care about is the year that they were created. Year is a number, it's not text. So by using a, a, a field of type integer, for example, I can enforce that no text is entered and that no decimal points are entered. It, 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 will, it won't say 2016.3, for example. And the established in is just a prefix to make it clear that what we're talking about. You can also have uh, URLs, emails, phone numbers, dates and times, these are called taxonomies, and so on. Drupal provides a lot of different fields. Uh, one thing to, to, to note is that fields are provided by modules. For example, in Drupal 8, there is a module that provides a field to store phone numbers. But if you, on a fresh Drupal installation, if you try to add a, a phone field, it won't appear. Why? Because the module is disabled out of the box. Like, you have to go and enable the module manually, and once you enable the module, the field is going to be available. So if someone tells you, if someone tells you that uh, a field is available, but you don't see it, it might be because the module is not uh, enabled yet, or you don't have the module at all, and you need to download the module and enable it. So, uh, that being said, fields are used to structure the information that you store on your website, they can save these three species of data that uh, you can use for displaying, filtering, sorting. We're going to see that in a moment. And when you work with fields, it is possible to enter and display the information in many different ways. <coughs> so, going back to this page. So far, we have talked about nodes, content types, and fields. On a regular page, for the most part, uh, it will be only the middle, the center part. So the center will, let's say 80% of the time, be a node. That node will be of one specific content type, and that node will contain several fields. For example, the title, the image, the tagline, the descriptions, and so on. So, so far, we have talked about like the, the center of a, of a page. Let's, let's talk about the rest. So everything that is not like in the middle is a block. So what is a block? A block is a container of extra information to display along the main content of your website. And blocks are placed in a theme region. So I'm going to take a short detour to, to explain what a theme region is. When we install Drupal 8 out of the box, we get this like blue theme, blue appearance out of the box. And that is called a theme, Bartik. And every theme will define theme regions. A theme region is a section on the theme, on the, on the page, where you can place content, where you can place blocks. So in, in this example, we can see that on the, on the blue-black background, there are three regions where I can place content. Then there is a white stripe called highlighted, a, a gray stripe called feature top, and then some more text like a sidebar on the left, a sidebar on the right, and some regions at the bottom. So we're, Everywhere where there is a yellow box, you can, you can place content, you can place blocks. Remember that the theme is the one responsible for controlling the appearance. Uh, let's say that I don't have any content on the right sidebar. If I don't have any content on the right sidebar for the Bartik theme, what it will do is it will collapse the sidebar. Collapsing the sidebar means that it will remove that region and the main content region in the, in the center is going to expand 
to use that space. And the same applies for the sidebar on the left, like either left or right, if you don't put any block in those regions, Bartik will expand the main content region to use the whole width of the page, everything that is available. Uh, the same happens with the, the gray stripe called feature top. If you don't put anything there, uh, Bartik will collapse that and you won't see that gray stripe at all. On the other hand, the, the footer first, second, third, and fourth at the bottom, if you place content, for example, in footer second, it will only use that 25% that is bound to that region. Like it will not expand automatically. And again, it is the theme responsibility to determine how the different regions are going to behave. Some will collapse, some will not collapse. It, the, the theme decides what to do. And it's not obvious in this screenshot, but uh, the theme regions uh, also change position when you, for example, go to the mobile version of the website. When you go to mobile, you will see content, then left sidebar, and then right sidebar. Even though on the desktop, you see them left, center, content, and right. So again, anything that has to do with how the site is going to look like is going to be controlled by the theme. So we know now that what is a theme region, and we know that blocks can be placed in theme region. So let's talk about blocks. So blocks can display static or dynamic content. Uh, static content is one that is going to be the same or almost the same every time. For example, if you have a copyright text at the bottom, let's say copyright 2018, that is going to change once a year. So that's basically you know, static. Or in an event like this one, where we, when we have sponsors, we want to show the logos of the sponsors in every page. So that's basically a static content that rarely changes. On the other hand, you can have you can have dynamic content. For example, if you have blog post uh, and you have one blog post every day, that is going to be changing every day. If you have you know a store and you are adding products every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes that's going to be updated. And you can configure Drupal to update automatically based on what you are adding to the website. Blogs can also enforce visibility rules. And by that I mean you can decide when to show or when to hide a blog. For example, if you have you know, a blog section in your website, uh, you can have, when you go to an article, let's say this article was written by Mauricio, and I want to see other articles written by the same person. That blog makes sense in the context of an article, like more articles by Mauricio, more articles by Ben, and so on. But the more articles by the same author blog doesn't make sense when you, are be, when you are viewing a car, because when you view a car, it doesn't make sense to have more articles written by this car. So you can, by content type, which is a concept that we already covered, you can say this is going to be available only in the article content type, or this is going to be available only in the car content type. You can also do it by language, if it's a multilingual site, like English, Spanish, and French. You can also do it by pages. That is, like this is only going to be available in the front page, or only in the contact page, or everywhere except in the services section of my website, and so on. So you can do it by path in the URL. And you can also do it by roles. That has to do with users. Uh, blogs can also be aware of their environment. Uh, and that is, for example, if you are showing a blog in the context of a node, the blog can be configured to read information from the node to change its, its content. Again, like more articles but by the same author. Uh, more articles by the same author. Uh, the blog is going to read, this article was written by Mauricio, let's update our content to show articles from Mauricio, or by Ben and so on. Or more, artic more vehicles on sale in the same city. Maybe your retail store spans many different counties and you want to show uh, you know, per, per city. And you can do that with blogs. And blocks, in the same ways as content types, they can also have fields. So everything that I described for fields in the uh, before applies also for blocks. And for example, you can have a special offer block with a title, a description, and, and an image, and an expiration date. And you can configure that block so that it is going to be shown all the time until the expiration date arrives. So uh, you can also have fields with blocks. Another important concept is views. 
and videos is huge. Like literally, you can give whole week courses on views. You can ha you can there are many books dedicated to views, and I'm going to make a summary of two slides. So bear with me. A view is a listing of information. If you want to list the content that you have already collected in your website, you can use a view for that. Views can be used to uh, list notes, user comments, taxonomy terms, files, images, and so on. What is the job of a view? View will scan your website using uh, some cr criteria that you specify. And this is where fields come into place. You can say, I want to show a view of notes of type article that were published uh, by Mauricio from 2018 onwards. I want to show cars of, ty of, of you know, that are Toyotas, Yaris, 2010 onwards, and so on. When you, you can combine, uh, you can use fields to filter the information that you're going to present in a view. Once you have the list of elements, the, the list of notes that you want to present, the view will also allow you to present that information in many different formats. For example, you can configure it to show an HTML table, or an RSS feed, or a PDF document, or a CSV or Excel file, or an interactive map, or an image slideshow, or a JSON file, and so on. So you can have the exact same information as a table, but also on the same page, you can have a, a link that says download CSV file, download Excel file, download P PDF file, and all of that can be done with views. So the view will scan your website to collect the information and then allow you to present it in different formats. And this is an example of a view. In this case, we are showing cars. So uh, in the main, like the big main section, the big table, I am showing the play, the year, the make, the model, the image, the color, the transmission, and the type of fuel. It is important to note that uh, this was built uh, having a content type called car that is, has four different fields, like uh, play, year, make, and model. Those are different fields. But when I configure the view, I configure the view to present them together. It is not that internally they are one field. It's that I, once I, I have the field separate, I can combine them or modify them as, as I want before displaying them. In this case, I decided to combine those four fields in one column, but I can do any alteration that I want to make. Another thing that might not be obvious is that for the most part, the images are the same sizes and aspect ratios. Let's say that, again, this is a car dealership company with a lot of employees and they use their cell phones to take the photos. Everyone has a different cell phone, so the photos will come with different resolutions, different sizes, and so on. In Drupal, there is a system called image styles that um, will automatically process your, the images so that they are consistent when they are displayed. In this case, I want to make them small and follow this aspect ratio. Among other things, uh, you can, for example, make them grayscale. And you can also put watermarks on top of the image automatically. But there are many things that you can do. And again, this is functionality. So this is provided by modules. There are many modules that gives you image styles for image manipulation. Um, when you create a view, you can define like some default way to present it. But also, you can expose. Uh, this is the thing that we see here, where it says year, make, model, sort by order. Those are called exposed filters. And the use of expo uh, the exposed filter is that you will allow the end user of your website to change uh, you know, the list of things that you are presenting to whatever they are looking specifically. So they can change the year to whatever they want, the make to whatever they want, the model, and the way that the table is presented, like order. You can also, if you present a table, you can also make the table's headers sortable. So if you click on the table header, it will sort by ascending or descending, either numeric or alphabetical. And uh, this big you know, the table is a view. But on the top left, where it says uh, car, where, where random car, that is also a view. And this is a very interesting example because when I said before, uh, 
abuse listing of information, when I hear the word listing, I usually think of one or more elements. But in this case, <coughs> I am only presenting one. But uh, why a, a view can be used for showing only one element? Because the view can be configured to show one random element. So every time that I refresh this page, that card is going to be different. Another use case of having a view of only one element is when you want to show the most of, like the most, the best, let's say, the most visited website, the most popular car, the most relevant article, and so on. So you can have a view where you can only show one element, but uh, the view itself is supposed to show like the best of, of or the most of something. So, um, the, the, again, the main content is a view, and the the top left is also a view. And why so much theory? Like, why do I need to understand all these pieces to, to be, uh, you know, to, to be good at Drupal? Because Drupal love nest. If you come to Drupal from a, a front end uh, the, uh, standpoint, you will see that the markup that Drupal produces is like very nested in a lot of divs and hierarchies, probably more than needed. If you come from a development, backend development standpoint, you will see that the data structures that Drupal has, they are deeply nested in like 10 layers deep. But what is relevant to us is that Drupal nest concepts. So all the things that we have talked so far, they are combined together to build the websites, to assemble the websites. So for example, uh, let's go back to the more articles written by the same author. In order to show that piece of information, we're going to interact with at least five different concepts. On, on the outermost side, we uh, on the outermost uh, uh, side we have the theme region because if we want to show content, we want to put that content in a theme region. There is no option against that, so we need to select a theme region. Let's say the right sidebar. Then that in in, in regions we put blocks. So we put you know, the more articles by the same author blog in the right side of that region. Because we are showing a list of articles, let's assume that that list was created using a view. The view was configured to show uh, nodes of type article. And for each of those nodes, I am showing individual fields, like the title the, the, and the publication date, for example. So. It is one piece of information on the website, and I am already interacting with five different concepts. And for every block of information on the website, the same process applies. Like you are going to be interacting um, with a lot of elements. Um, and the elements can be swapped around. For example, instead of showing a, a view of nodes, you can show a view of users. Uh, instead of uh, a, bl a blog being created by a view, you can create a blog directly and you only have two layers, like the theme and the blog directly. So it is super important to understand why I, what, I, what am I dealing with to know uh, where, where do I need to go to make the changes. So if this was created a view, I go to the view administration page to change. If this was created using a node, I go to the node to modify it and so on. So it is super important uh, to have that in mind. Any question about this so far? Yes? I'm confused about the difference between blocks and views. So uh, those are different concepts. And the thing to remember is that views allow you to create blocks. So you can have a block that is a view. Uh, but for example, let's, uh, let's say a, a, a block that is not a view. You can go to the blog administration page and have uh, you know, your contact information like um, address, phone number, and so on. In the same way that you can create a regular node, you can create a regular blog, and you can place that blog in the footer of your page. And that is a blog that you created manually without interacting with a view, for example. Uh, there, for another use case can be, there can be a module, say, contact, that gives you a contact form. That contact form is going to be a blog that you can place on the right sidebar, for example. And that is a blog that was provided by a module. You didn't create it manually. It wasn't created using a view. It was provided by a specific module. So the thing to remember is that uh, there are many different ways to create these elements, like a blog can be done manually using a view or using a module. 
and by understanding where the, mod the, the block itself comes from, then you, you, you can be able to modify it as needed. Yes? So is it fair to say that the block is, is controlling the position of information on the page and how the um, responsive designs are going to work? It takes care of that, that kind of Okay, so I'm going to re uh, repeat for the recording. Is it safe to say the uh, blocks control the positioning of the elements on the page? Uh, it's a combination. Uh, it's a combination of the theme region and the block. So the theme region is going to say, like, everything inside the theme region is going to appear first, second, or third, for example. But once you are in that theme region, then the, the ordering of the blocks is important. So like, let's say on the right side, but if you have like a search box and more articles by the same author, that is going to be respected by the, by the blog. Again, you can override that using the theme. For example, with CSS, you can say that on my mobile version, even though the content is there, I want to hide it. Or even though the content is there, I want to swap the position. So to some extent, uh, the ordering of the blog within one specific theme region can define ordering, but again, the theme is the one who has the ultimate word, and they can overwrite whatever they want. Any other question? Okay, so I'm going to take more time than I should, so feel free to leave if you want to, but there are a couple of things that I want to cover quickly. Um, so now, we, we talk about that center, which is a node, but we also know, saw that the center can also be a view. And everything around, those are blocks. Uh, again, it is important to understand the different pieces uh, because there are different pages in the Drupal administration interface where you will go to make changes. Let's talk about users and permissions. So in Drupal, a user is anyone who visits your website. And depending on who is visiting the website, it is possible to change the information that those people are going to see. Drupal can handle multiple users, as I said before, and you can keep track of changes of any interaction that they make on the website. I've got another session here in nine minutes. Um, so users um, can have fields, as I said before. Users can have images, can have uh, user IDs, that to identify them, and they can have URL aliases. Uh, if you want to give permissions to someone to do anything, uh, you would use a role, and a role is simply a collection of a permission, and a permission is just a yes or no question. So can someone create articles? Can someone co post comment? Can someone use the contact on my website? So that is a permission. And the role is a collection of permissions. So if you want to give Mauricio the chance to post articles to your websites, the way that that works is uh, you create a role with those permissions, and you assign those permissions to Mauricio. Uh, it, there is no direct like permission to user. It's like permission role user. And the user is going to have the sum of all the permissions defined in all the roles. So. With that, uh, I will finish. Thank you very much for being here today.